Good evening, welcome. Thank you for giving up your Wednesday night to um, attend this uh, 99th Bite Medicine webinar, uh, this time on personality disorders. My name is Rich. Uh, I'm, as of today, an F2 doctor working in the West Midlands, and I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine. So the sort of uh, background of Bite Medicine for those who haven't attended a webinar before is not only do we do webinars, but we also have an online question bank and textbook where you can consolidate all of your learning. Um, it's free to join. And uh, if you like what we do, there's always options to um, upgrade to a premium package. So please do check us out. Um, today's session, uh, we'll be running through uh, quickly what is personality um, and then a brief uh, discussion about personality disorders, um, both uh, recognizing them and the management of them. Um, and then we're going to mainly focus on the clusters, so the three clusters of personality disorders, how to recognize them, um, and a couple of sort of key facts about each. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to keep this under an hour, um, but if you can't stay for the whole thing, we will upload the slides and the recordings to our uh, website um, shortly after the webinar. And as I say, there will be some questions uh, to play along with today, and if you are into that kind of thing, then do join menti.com, and when it asks you for the code, Code is 84, 17, 84, 12. And I'm just gonna put that in the chat as well. Fantastic, okay. So I did just want to mention that obviously this can be a sensitive topic for some people. If um, you have some friends or family members that do have personality disorders, um, it can be quite distressing. But I just wanted to say up front that, um, you know, uh, if anything that's talked about today does does trigger you in any way, um, then uh, please know you, you can email to get in touch. Um, so I just wanted to say that up front. So what is personality? Essentially, it just describes how humans respond to the environment around them. OK, and um, in particular, it is the individual differences between two humans in the way that they think, feel and behave. And no two personalities are identical. Um, it's thought that it arises due to a mixture of genetics and also environmental experiences. And we see this with lots of different conditions. So it's not just um, psychiatry. And when we think, you know, what is personality? It's 4,000 different traits, all those little nuances that, you know, make you um, sort of uh, choose the friends you do and the sort of um, behaviors and mannerisms that you display. Um, but in essentially, you can break them down into the big five. And this is how agreeable you are, um, how hardworking you are, how um, extroverted or introverted you are, how neurotic you can be, and uh, your openness in, in general. And so what we tend to see is that all of these traits lie on a spectrum from, you know, completely introverted to completely extroverted, for example. Um, and most people are in the middle, it's sort of a, a normal distribution. Um, but it's these, these ends, these, um, these extremes of these traits that tend to yield these maladaptive personalities. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So key features of personality disorders. Well, they have to be chronic. OK, so they have to uh, they, they tend to start in sort of childhood or adolescence, um, but they have to be persistent, unwavering. And um, the key is that they have to be maladaptive. OK, so usually getting in the way of normal functioning. Um, and uh, the DSM-5, which is one of the psychiatric manuals that helps to kind of uh, categorize uh, psychiatric conditions, uh, states that you need to have um, impaired function in at least two of the following domains. So the way in which you think, which is like cognitive perceptual, interpersonal functioning, so the way you interact with others, affect regulation, which is sort of your mood, um, and impulse control. Um, so, you know, these are things like um, sort of spending money in excess, gambling, um, criminal activities, all that kind of thing where, you know, your brain says, do it, and you say, okay. Um, and what we tend to see is that these personalities disorders coincide with other psychiatric conditions, um, commonly things like depression or anxiety, or they may occur in tandem with another personality disorder. And we broadly group them into these three clusters, which you may have heard of. 
So when you're in the exam and you're faced with um, a uh, vignette that seems to be describing a personality disorder, I would urge you that the first thing you do um, is try and cluster them and say, is this, is this person exhibiting odd and eccentric behavior? Are they being dramatic or are they being anxious and reserved? And once you've got it down to those, that cluster, there's only a couple or two or three that, that could be within each. And so we're gonna run through those today and I'll get you guys trying to, to decipher them using some single best answer questions. In terms of you know, how prevalent it is in the population, so a 2006 study uh, suggested that about 4.4% of the population uh, could be diagnosed with a personality disorder. Um, and the prevalence is greater supposedly in white people compared to other ethnicities. Um, however, some uh, research performed by um, Lucille McLean et al. in 2019 suggests that actually um, this you know, finding might not actually be correct and there might actually be some cross-cultural biases in diagnosing um, PDs in other ethnicities as well as other ethnicities potentially disengaging from services more. So that's in terms of epidemiology, but why do people end up being at risk of developing PDs? Well, you know, the, the classic um, discussion about things that happen in childhood um, is, is critical to um, the development of the condition. So any history of abuse, be it from partners, from parents, from you know, friends or neighbours. Um, oftentimes a family history of schizophrenia correlates quite strongly with the development of uh, personality disorders. Um, and uh, you, you can't understate the impact of negative parenting um, on, on that development. In terms of management, so essentially that it's really important to be able to identify those that are attending ED who may have a personality disorder. And in the emergency setting, what you're essentially looking to do is to work out whether or not um, someone is at risk of suicide. And there are screening tools out there that you, uh, you can use um, to assess that. Um, and if, if you're worried about um, you know, suicidality, then there is always the option to involve sort of liaison psychiatry um, and consider sectioning. Um, but in the sort of longer um, chronic management of PDs, essentially the most important thing is um, psychotherapy. Okay, so um, talking therapies, principally the most common one is DBT. And this is quite a common SBA to be asked. So you're given a personality disorder and you're asked what would be the most effective management option. Um, and it tends to be this dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. And this can be in group therapy or, or uh, individual therapy. And it usually requires a specialized service um, in order to, to deliver um, this treatment. Um, and each uh, patient will have an individual care plan that's written for them that helps the therapist and helps the individual to know what their boundaries are, what is acceptable. So when I was at medical school, I pretty much stopped there and thought, well, I don't need to know anymore. But I thought I'd just throw in a couple of little bits about dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT. So essentially it's, it's modus operandi is to help people to develop a life worth living, okay? And it does that by targeting common problems that people will face teaching them mindfulness, how to be aware of what they're doing, um, and also interpersonal effectiveness. So teaching them why, when they say X to a person and they get a Y response, that, that occurs. Why, why are they achieving this? And actually teaching them that potentially saying something else or responding in a certain way will yield a better response. Um, it teaches them how to cope with distress and also to not see everything in such black and white terms and walk this middle path, which is where this term dialectical comes from. It's important to state that often in SBAs, they'll throw in um, an option of pharmacotherapy as management. Now this will only work for any comorbid conditions like depression or anxiety. It, it will not work to treat a um, personality disorder. And I think that's critical to mention. So without further ado, we're gonna launch straight into the, um, the cluster A and look at some of the personality disorders within that. So kicking off, we've got a 29 year old man who is unable to maintain intimate relationships with potential sexual partners. He's generally mistrusting of them as he believes they're only interacting with him to improve their social standing. He has a criminal record for assaulting one of his ex-partners 
although he claims this was because they were trying to steal his diary. He struggles to keep close friends as he is unforgiving if they wrong him in any way. So here is the first question of the webinar. So which is the most likely diagnosis? So I'm just going to keep that up there whilst I take us over to menti.com. So we've got histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal. I'll just leave that up there for a few more moments. Okay. And let's see what you guys are saying. Okay, so we've got two for paranoid and uh, one for schizoid. So correct answer is paranoid, fantastic stuff. So let's have a little look at why that is the case. So paranoid personality disorder, the key features that you guys need to remember is a lack of trust and a pattern of suspiciousness in others. Okay, so those are those key features. And all the time with all of these personality disorders, you need to be remembering that it's that chronic, unwavering, maladaptive behavior that may have began in adolescence or early adulthood and is unchanging and is affecting their, their social life, it's affecting their work life. Um, so let's do a little bit more about paranoid personality disorder. So it's more common in males than females. And other than having a pattern of suspiciousness, um, the individual will have this tendency to feel that um, any comment that's made to them is an attack on their character. And um, oftentimes they will, they will question the loyalty of their friends. They're hypersensitive and they're unforgiving. Um, and they're often uh, found to be preoccupied with conspiracy beliefs, hidden meanings in things, and essentially what you, know, what you define as, as paranoia. Um, now, you, know, you may hear some of those traits and think, you know, I've, I've seen that before, but actually what, you know, this is the extreme of that behavior um, and uh, affects these, these individuals in every walk of their life. It's important to say here the difference between delusions and paranoia. Um, just in case you're faced with it in your exams. So delusions, they're irrational beliefs that are held with a very, very high level of conviction. Um, and even when challenged, these individuals will tend to be resistant to that change. So we often see um, delusions as part of a sort of psychotic picture where they won't, they won't take in what you're saying, they won't uh, believe it. Whereas with the paranoid personality disorder patients, there is this idea that actually, if you sit them down, um, engage in proper psychotherapy, you might be able to get to a point where you can rationalize some of their more extreme thoughts. So without further ado, case number two. So this time we've got a 19 year old male. Now he's stopped leaving his house to attend social gatherings. He's been withdrawn for several years and is often abrasive and rude to his own family. He has few, if any, friends. He's unable to hold down a job or have a romantic relationship due to his behavior. And he spends most of his time on his games console, rarely seeking pleasure from other activities. We've got a picture of him here, looking all sad out the window. So I'll take you over to the next question on the PowerPoint. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, we're using code 8417, 8412. So the question for this gentleman is, which is the most likely diagnosis? And our options this time are schizoid personality disorder, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. So I've purposely created this question to throw in all these schizo uh, conditions, and we can have a bit of a chat about each one just so you can get it clear in your head uh, once we reveal the answer. So I'll just give it a few more moments uh, before we get on to um, the answer reveal. Okay, so let's see what everybody's saying. Fantastic. So 100% are thinking schizoid personality disorder, and that would be the right answer. So well done. So let's have a little chat about what these different definitions are. Ah, so we'll start with the schizoid and we can go into further detail on the, the next slide. But essentially, 
It is a cold, aloof, withdrawn personality where the individual often has very few close friends. Uh, the other personality disorder is the one at the bottom here, which is our schizotypal personality disorder. And now these patients are the sort of epitome of that cluster A odd eccentric. So they tend to be you know, very sort of different to other individuals and they are often said to have this magical thinking, um, run away with the fairies. And we can have a little look at um, some of their features um, on the next few slides as well. Now the three in the middle. So um, I'll start with schizophrenia. Um, which I understand we've already done a, a webinar on. Um, but with schizophrenia, you essentially need this, this combination of um, positive uh, and negative features um, and psychosis, essentially. So those features of hallucination, delusions, or you know, a clear thought disorder like thought insertion or thought withdrawal. Um, there are none of those in this case. Okay, the, the, the patient isn't psychotic. So we can take schizophrenia away as an option. The same for schizophreniform disorder. So this um, is not used as commonly as the other um, conditions, uh, condition titles here. This is essentially when the symptoms of schizophrenia are present for more than a month, but aren't meeting that threshold of six months that we often need to diagnose schizophrenia. So you may see this term banded around. The final one is our schizoaffective disorder. Now, this is a term that's used to combine schizophrenia and depression and anxiety. So we said affect, affect is mood, essentially, which is where our depression and anxiety come in. Now, the fact that the patient doesn't have um, clear schizophrenia and doesn't seem to really be anxious, you could potentially argue that there's an element of depression with that kind of withdrawn case. Um, but overall, the most likely diagnosis here is without a doubt a schizoid personality disorder. Um, and if you haven't realized already, this is a webinar on personality disorders. So uh, th there was a little clue there as well. So let's just go into the schizoid a little bit more detail. So again, it's more common in males. And the classic features are this emotional coldness, lack of desire to join in with anybody else, prefer to be on your own, few friends, and... The way I often used to remember this was I used to think about Christian Bale's Batman, um, him in his Batcave, you know, not interacting with others, you know, I, you know, adopting the dark. Um, now bats are only in the dark, so I used to remember it as only in dark schizoid, because um, I used to have a bit of trouble remembering which one was schizoid, and which one was schizotypal. So. If, for me, this just works. If it works for you, wonderful. If you think it's ridiculous, please let me know. Um, so yeah, only in the dark, OID at the end of schizoid. So Christian Bale as Batman is the, is the archetypal schizoid personality disorder for, for trying to remember it. When we think about schizotypal personality disorder then, again, more common in males, which makes cluster A all more common in males. You, that might be a clue in the vignette. These um, individuals are, you know, you can think of them as the mad hatter. They often have inappropriate affect for the situation. So they might be too happy or too sad, um, not being able to apply things correctly. Um, oftentimes uh, you may see this term ideas of reference um, be applied to schizotypal. And this essentially means that when, when something random happens in the world, they will try and find meaning in it, okay? And uh, this often stems from the fact, um, you know, it relates to some um, abuse or something that happened in childhood. And it's their way of trying to deal with the world and say, well, no, things don't just happen. They happen for a reason. Um, so you may see this term ideas of reference be used. Um, and they may have uh, funny speech mannerisms, um, different tones of voice, different pitches. And they may dress quite elaborately or just slightly off um, for the, what, you know, what is what is acceptable for a particular situation. And, um, you know, we've already talked a little bit about, um, you know, the element of psychosis being key to schizophrenia, but not key to these personality disorders. So um, whilst it can be quite difficult to disentangle when you're in the, the, the heat of the exam or faced with a patient, you know, you really want to be looking for hallucinations, delusions, thought disorders um, to help identify that psychotic element that would say maybe this is schizophrenia rather than something else. And I remember from my own finals, quite a difficult psych SBA 
um, where you know the first 80% of the question was clearly describing a personality disorder and then right at the end they threw in just a couple of psychotic features um, and want, they just wanted to pull you away and really test that understanding um, of can you recognize psychosis amongst you know some other bizarre symptoms. So that leads us on to cluster B. So this is the dramatic cluster and it's the one that I think um, uh, going into med school, you often know more about, you don't really need medical training to know about some of these personality disorders. Um, you know, you, you hear about the psychopath, which is often viewed as the antisocial personality disorder, um, the borderline personality disorder, which is our EUPD. Um, but we're going to go through, through each in turn. So if you haven't heard about them before, um, we'll, we'll cover each. So we're going to go straight into a case. And this time we have a female, so a 20 eight-year-old woman who's having trouble at work and in her social life. So before I go any further, again, straight away, this should be ringing alarm bells for maladaptive behavior within their, their life. Um, and if you see this in an SBA, you think, okay, wh where are we going with this? This clearly won't, they want me to know that. She's had repeated warnings at work for flirtatious behavior, though she defends this behavior as innocent. She refuses to conform to the dress code and instead dresses in various Halloween costumes to amuse the office. In her social life, she struggles to maintain close relationships with friends, despite her claims that she has many best friends. So which is the most likely diagnosis? So I'll take us over back to Menti and we can go through the options. So we've got histrionic personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. I'll just give it a few more moments whilst you, you vote. Let's see what people are saying. Okay, so we've got four for histrionic and one for schizotypal. So let's see. So the majority wins. Well done. Fantastic. So yeah, this is histrionic personality disorder. So key features of histrionic. Um, I, I believe that the histrionic comes from hysterical, dramatic, um, is this attention-seeking behavior and sexual provocativeness. So it's more common in females, um, but there is um, a caveat to that in that perhaps actually we're just overdiagnosing it in females due to a societal issue where, you know, males may not be accused of being sexually provocative when something similar that a, a female does could be. So there was um, some interesting literature uh, about that overdiagnosis in women, but it is generally established that it is more common in, in women. Um, so yeah, the, the definition of histrionic is this exaggerated dramatic behavior designed to attract attention. So these individuals, they may be flirtatious, seductive, and charming, um, oftentimes manipulative. They will use that, uh, those, the, that, that arsenal of um, behavior to get what they want. They will find themselves to be very uncomfortable when they're not in the center of attention. Um, and uh, they may often, just for the attention, try and embarrass their friends and family because it will amplify what they have, what they have uh, done. And they'll often look at people and, and, and what is quite a distant relationship, they may be, you know, be suggesting that is their best friend which is why we saw that in, in the case as the, the final um, point about her social life. So that's histrionic personality disorder. Next up, we've got a 23-year-old male medical student who is facing a GMC fitness to practice tribunal due to ongoing reports of behavioral misconduct. He's been described by doctors as arrogant, and some have even raised concerns about his lack of empathy when interacting with patients. He's challenged on this behavior. He shows little insight and explains that he's top of his class, 
regularly publishes in medical journals. So he deserves the respect of his peers, of his patients, um, and of the um, medical clinicians that run the med school. So once again, we ask, which is the most likely diagnosis? We've got dependent personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and schizotypal personality disorder. I'll give it a few more moments. So group majority are saying narcissistic personality disorder. You'd be absolutely right. Well done. So there were a couple of um, points in this SBA where um, it was suggestive quite strongly that there was narcissism involved. Um, and just going back to the case, um, I did throw in this idea about lack of empathy when interacting with patients. It's a bit of a red herring um, if you were sort of drawn tor or torn between antisocial versus narcissistic. But I think overall, this patient definitely is exhibiting signs of narcissism. So the, the, the key features, a grandiose sense of self-importance. So I think, you know, we've all been medical students or we all currently are a PA or medical students. And, you know, it's such a tough ride to get into to these, um, these degrees. Um, on arrival, it's, it's quite easy to fall into that trap of thinking, I've made it, I'm, I'm top of my game now. Um, but obviously, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's not necessarily the case. And so um, it's uh, it's quite a classic scenario to see um, in an SBA that they actually use the medical student example of entitlement and self-importance. So the um, there's a lot of uh, sort of information on the Internet that's suggested that Kanye West might be a good example of um, someone with narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, he was once uh, quoted as saying, I'm the number one rock star on the planet. Um, so key features and of a narcissistic personality, we've said that the grandiose sense of self-importance often seen sometimes as exaggerating your achievements. This expectation that you get favorable treatment and arrogant, haughty behavior, and you believe that you are special, um, and you'll often be, or it, it, an individual will be, um, envious of others, um, you know, jealous of what they have, wanting to beat them. Um, and uh, they, whilst it's, you know, not the, the number one criteria, they also seem to lack empathy as well. Um, so, you know, if it, if it helps to apply a model to each of these personality disorders, uh, here is Kanye West for you. So next up, we've got the antisocial personality disorder. Now, this is responsible for many, many TV shows and films, um, and is often the personality disorder that we associate with the psychopath or the sociopath. So on the right here, we've got Ted Bundy. Um, so he is um, widely regarded as one of you know, the um, history's you know, most prolific serial killers. So we often see this um, antisocial uh, personality disorder in men, particularly young men. And the key features that we'll see are repeated acts that are performed leading to arrest. They, they take the law into their own hands. They have disregard for their health, for others. They show very little remorse. Um, if you've ever watched any interviews uh, you know, on these, these documentaries where they um, you go into prisons, uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch, um, you know, confirmed diagnosed psychopaths and the way that they, they talk to the camera and talk to the uh, interviewer. They're often described as impulsive, aggressive, um, and classically they don't learn from their experiences. They don't, don't get that warning that says, oh, I did X and it resulted in me going to prison. I won't do X again. Um, so, uh, so that is an example of antisocial personality disorder, and you can contrast that against narcissistic, and it, you can definitely tell there's, there's a difference there. Um, the key one being this sort of criminal element. So 
The last of our dramatic personality disorders, cluster B, we have got a 21 year old woman who self admits to the emergency department with fresh lacerations to her wrists bilaterally. Her notes show that this is her third admission for uh, self injury. And she tells the clerking doctor that she gets impulses to hurt herself after arguing with friends or family. She often finds that people treat her nicer after she hurts herself. And she has multiple sexual relationships currently, however, does not think she could settle with any of them. So, which is the most likely diagnosis? There are options here. Antisocial personality disorder, avoidant anxious, dependent, emotionally unstable, or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And I'll just give you a few more moments. Okay, so majority of you are leaning towards EUPD, Emotionally Unstable Personality Disorder, and we've got a vote for dependent. So, correct answer is EUPD. And let's have a little look at what that is. So, key features here, poor impulse control, unstable interpersonal relationships, and self-injury. So, I think the, the key feature of EUPD are these unstable interpersonal relationships. So the way in which the individual interacts with others, the relationships they form are often very intense, very inflammatory, and um, you know, can, can be up and down. Um, and EUPD is often you know, deemed to be the personality disorder that dialectical behavioral therapy was built for. Essentially, we spoke about dialectical behavioral therapy or DBT earlier in that the way it teaches you interpersonal skills, you know, saying X will yield Y, maybe try saying something else. And, and you know, the way in which you, you know, present yourself to the world and what you'll get back. Um, and this is exactly why it does help in EUPD. So these individuals, unstable affect, so their mood is up and down and very labile. Um, poor impulse control, so they may have multiple sexual partners, they may engage in substance abuse or gambling. This personality disorder is correlated quite highly with self-injury and suicidality. Um, it may not be that the individual, you know, always actually intends to take their own life, but there may be a, a threatening element to it. Um, and um, from, from my own experience of speaking with um, a, a dialectical behavioral therapist as preparation for this webinar, um, I'm led to believe that when they're, they're working with these patients, they set out very clear um, boundaries for what is and isn't acceptable, you know, if their threats carry meaning, um, when to be concerned, when to, you know, uh, intervene, when not to intervene. Um, and I think, you know, it sounds like a very, very difficult um, um, job um, and one that if you, you're interested in psychiatry and intend to pursue it would be one that, you know, would be um, critical. Um, it was often termed as a borderline personality disorder, and that borderline essentially meant the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. And so in some cases in EUPD, there can be these transient episodes where with intense stress, um, there can be some element of um, psychosis involved. So the classic um, sort of epidemiology for this uh, or demographic for this patient um, is uh, young women. So that's cluster B. Um, so we're on the home and dry now, finishing up with cluster C personality disorders. And these are often termed as the anxious type. So we've got case-based discussion six, a 25 year old man works as an accountant. He is seeking help from his GP as he is becoming increasingly stressed from his job. He is obsessed with perfecting his work due to fears that his boss will take issue with his output. 
He's experiencing extreme anxiety due to this and has been doing so for several years now. In his personal life, he has poor self-esteem and often will make excuses to absent himself from social engagements. Despite this, when he is alone, he craves contact and this is causing him to feel depressed. And once again, you guessed it, which is the most likely diagnosis? So we've got antisocial, avoidant, anxious, dependent, emotionally unstable, and obsessive compulsive. And from my personal experience, I actually find that the, the cluster C uh, anxious um, cluster is usually the hardest to, to, to disentangle, um, but we'll see whether you guys uh, are on to something. Okay, so we've got a majority. So the majority are, are leaning towards this avoidant anxious personality disorder with one vote on dependent. So here the majority wins, well done. So it's the avoidant anxious type. So let's have a little look at what the key features were that, that made this uh, stand out. So in summary, it's the fear of rejection and criticism that drives these individuals, okay? Their behavior is, is driven by that fear and wanting to, to not experience that rejection and criticism. Um, they'll often be extremely anxious and, and the, you'll have a comorbidity of anxiety with it. Um, this often develops as a result of um, uh, quite classically uh, negative parental input during childhood, um, you know, perhaps either an overbearing parent or, or not enough input. Um, so um, this personality disorder is equally seen in men and women. It stems from a childhood issue primarily. Um, so the individual will go to great lengths to avoid their feared stimuli, whether it's work, whether it's social settings, they will do what they can to avoid it. And it can actually be quite difficult in SBAs to disentangle this from phobias. Um, but I think, you know, you need to fall back on the, this classic thing of, um, a chronic unwavering maladaptive behavior whereas you know it might be the case that in the SBA for a phobia there'll be one key event that happened and since then they've developed you know um, a, a fear of a, a you know unique stimuli. Um, these individuals often have very low self-esteem they see themselves as inept and inferior and one, one, one uh, key uh, aspect of it is that whilst they are withdrawn from society, they actually have a strong desire for intimacy and to be included, um, which again will link back to that neglect and abuse that, that may have happened during childhood. So finally, we've got uh, CBD7. So a 24-year-old woman struggles at work and in social settings. At work, she finds it difficult to delegate to others as she thinks the job is done best when she attempts it. However, she takes twice as long to do tasks as she becomes fixated on unimportant details. In social settings, she alienates friends by commenting on their loose morals and is often very inflexible about times and dates for activities. Final question of the day, which is the most likely diagnosis? So the options here are antisocial, avoidant, dependent, emotionally unstable, and obsessive compulsive. Okay, let's see where the majority have gone. So we've got 100% votes for obsessive compulsive personality disorder, and you bang on the money. Well done all. So let's have a little look at. OCPD or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So I want to just first mention, and we'll discuss it a, a little bit uh, at the bottom, OCD and OCPD are different things. Okay, so in OCPD, equally prevalent in men and women, it is actually the most common of the personality disorders. So we often hear about the, the psychopath 
the EUPD or the histrionic, but it is the obsessive compulsive personality disorder that is deemed to be most common. They, these individuals are obsessed with perfection, rigid morals, the black and white, and values. Um, they're very inflexible with, you know, arrangements with their own life, the way in which others conduct themselves and they'll critique them for it. They are incredibly preoccupied with um, rules, order, often unimportant details that can be detrimental to their um, behavior and the way in which they interact in the, the world. And they lack a sense of humor. Um, and in this, uh, in this case, we saw this individual, individual was often unwilling to share their workload, felt that they could do it best. So um, the, the classic is that they don't delegate well. So I wanted to briefly touch upon this OCD versus OCPD. So OCD is deemed to be an axis one uh, disorder, which is essentially where the individual develops it later on in life and they recognize that it is affecting their life detrimentally. So these people with OCD, you know, can become emotional and may actually seek out help for their issue. Whereas the axis two or the um, OCPD um, often occurs much younger, is chronic, unwavering, and the individual may not have that insight to say, this is affecting uh, my relationships, this is affecting my work. Um, so just to be aware that there, there are differences in the two. And finally, uh, there was no point in me making an SBA on this one because it's the last of the major personality disorders. So I just thought we'd run through it. So dependent personality disorder, it's more common in women than men. And essentially it is where they have a difficulty in making decisions often about their own life unless they have all the support in the world. They need excessive reassurance um, and uh, without that they'll lack initiative to make any decisions um, for themselves, often described as incredibly passive. Um, and they'll go actually out of their way to uh, get others to make these decisions uh, for them. Um, and oftentimes this has arisen from childhood due to either an overprotective or an authoritarian uh, parent or guardian. Um, which has resulted in the individual growing up with this inability to make decisions for themselves. So that is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for joining. Um, I can see uh, we've got a couple of questions, which I'll just quickly cover at the end. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in. Uh, if um, you have enjoyed the webinars and you do want to see what more bite medicine has to offer and you haven't yet made a premium account you can use my discount code richard2021 for 20 percent off a um, monthly subscriber package and you can also get in touch uh, to tell us you know what you'd like to see in upcoming webinars you can instagram us and dm us you can email us um, you can email me personally if you have any particular questions um, so uh, thank you very much and I'll just have a quick look to see if I'm able to answer any of these questions. But thank you. And, and I hope you all have a lovely evening um, and uh, the, a lovely rest of the week.